Good afternoon again, everyone. And thank you so much for coming today to learn about First 10. Um, I, for those of you who I might not have met yet, I'm Leanne Larson and I direct the early learning division in the main department of education. And I'm so pleased this afternoon to see all of you and that you're interested in learning more about First 10. I'm gonna pass the uh, baton in just a minute to David Jacobson, who's gonna lead most of this session for us. But I wanna set a little bit of context first on the front end that will kind of help us um, as I hand it off to, to him. Um, so we are having this wonderful opportunity of being able to share um, about First 10 with you. And um, as you'll learn as we go along, this is in, in preparation for the department um, posting a request for applications for um, some school systems in our state to get involved in this work over the next few years. But our journey with First 10 started several years ago in actuality. So way back in 2018, our department had a uh, preschool expansion grant that was working across 13 school systems in the state. And one of the pieces that we were really um, excited to be able to work on with those school systems was um, looking at models that would help the school and the community to work more collaboratively together to improve both the transitions for children and families as they're coming up through their preschool years and into the early elementary grades, as well as the alignment of programming. And so our team at the department did some work sort of researching what are some of the models that exist. And one that we um, came to that we felt like was a really good fit for us in Maine is um, the work that EDC has been doing related to First 10. At the time, it wasn't actually called First 10. It was referred to as B3 or P3. And um, David will, you know, I'm sure touch on that a little bit more. But um, he, we were fortunate to be able to work with David um, to both support the 13 communities in forming leadership teams and developing First 10 plans and beginning to implement those, as well as working with us at the department and across a couple of our state agencies. And um, in 2019, the grant came to an end and we were just getting ready to keep supporting those 13 sites. And as all of you will remember, as we went into 2020, we entered a pandemic. And that made it a little more challenging for us to um, both in terms of supporting and I think for the communities who had gotten work underway, but maybe not as fully as they had hoped. And so we've been waiting for a little while to be able to kind of get back on track, get things up and going again. And we had the good fortune of being awarded a preschool development grant this past December, and we wrote in the opportunity to um, basically resurrect our work and um, jumpstart it again. And so that's what we're gonna be doing. And um, David's gonna provide some really good background information about this model. And then we'll talk a little bit about what to expect in the RFA um, that we're hopeful is gonna be coming out in the next um, week or so. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to David Jacobson and he will lead us forward. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leanne. Uh, I appreciate it. So I'm David Jacobson from the Education Development Center EDC. I'm here with Akira Gutierrez and Courtney Arthur from EDC. And I'll tell you more about us in a moment. Uh, I'll just start off by saying we're really excited about this initiative where we're going to be talking about the possibility of creating first 10 partnerships in your communities. And these are school community partnerships focused on the first decade of life, supporting young children and their families. Um, we were we really appreciated working in Maine several years ago. Those communities did some really great initial work and we're excited to be back. 
Uh, and I'll say here, Leanne and her colleagues, not only in the Department of Ed, but across the state agencies have really shown a lot of commitment to supporting communities in developing partnerships to support young children and their families. And they've kept this work going. They've continued to work on this. And I think they're, they, in doing so, they've developed what I like to refer to as the a special main secret sauce. That is to say, there are some main specific innovations in the design of this work. And uh, we think that those innovations will increase the benefit of the work for children and families. So we're super excited about that. Um, I would love to just pause for a moment. I'll show you, I have a presentation to show you. Let's keep it informal. You know, we'll talk along the way. But before we do that, if we could just quickly go around and if you could just say your name and uh, the community that you're working in or name role in the community that you're working in, that would be great. And I'll just follow the grid on my screen and I'll start with uh, Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Bartash. I'm the curriculum director in SAD 17, which is Oxford Hills region. Great. Welcome. And Jane. Uh, I am uh, Jane Osborne and I am helping RSU 9, uh, Blue, Mount Blue uh, Regional District uh, in grant writing. All right, great. Thank you, Jane. Kate. My name is Kate Friend. I'm a social worker at Camden Rockport Elementary. Okay, great. Welcome, Christina. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Braga, and I am a school board member in RSU 20, Searsport, Stockton Springs. Great. Uh, Shanna. Hi, I'm Shanna Crofton, and I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning in Yarmouth. Okay, Yarmouth. Welcome. And Tenny. Hi, I'm Tenny Spiegel. I'm the principal at Searsport Elementary School. Okay, great. And Nicole? Hello, I'm Nicole Chaplin. I work for Kennebec Valley Community Action Program. I'm a program director overseeing our partnerships with public schools in Somerset County. Uh, in particular, I'm here representing MSAD 54, which is the Skowhegan area. Great, thank you, Nicole and Jessica. Am I introducing myself? Sorry that I'm late. Oh, yeah. Just name, name, role, and community. All right, um, I'm Jessica Berry. I'm the Assistant Superintendent and Special Ed Director um, at St. George MSU. Sorry for being late. No, no worries at all. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Jessica and uh, Akira. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I had to reach some iPad. Uh, my name is Akira Gutierrez, and I am a first time team facilitator. Very happy to be here and happy to be uh, learning from all of you. Thank you, Akira. And Courtney. Hi, everyone. I'm just like Akira. My name is Courtney Arthur. I am a first time team facilitator as well. All right, fantastic. All right, thanks, everybody. I will uh, dive in now. We'll, we'll pause along the way, ask questions. Um, uh, look, uh, look, I'm looking forward to discussing this exciting uh, opportunity with you all. So Akira Courtney and I work at the Education Development Center, EDC. We are a mission-driven nonprofit organization focused on education, health, and expanding economic opportunity. And we work with a large team of colleagues across the United States uh, who have expertise in uh, early childhood uh, and elementary school uh, care and education. And that's very helpful. We draw on that expertise as we do this work in uh, First 10. So I think by way of introducing First 10, I, it's helpful to think about three big ideas. The first is that research supports a community-wide approach to the first 10 years, meaning uh, bridging early childhood in K-12 education and bridging education, health, and social services. The second big idea is that innovative communities across the country, both communities that we've studied through applied research, as well as the um, approximately uh, 50 communities that we've supported through our uh, first 10 and transition to K uh, work, 
uh, together have really created a roadmap. And that roadmap addresses teaching and learning, partnerships with families, and comprehensive services. As you know from all of your work, some communities, some initiatives focus on teaching and learning in classrooms, others focus on partnerships with families and comprehensive services. We really uh, focus on all three. Uh, our reading of the research is that all three are important. And the third big idea is that First 10 provides a framework, a planning process, and a set of strategies to help guide local partnerships. So with those three big ideas in mind, I also want to mention that this work is centered around the fundamental challenges of poverty. Uh, there, we have a consensus in the United States, certainly among the public and among experts, that early childhood, uh, the best way to address the challenges of poverty is to start early, but how we do that is important. We know from the research that children need consistent quality each and every year. No one year, as, as important as high quality pre-K is, no one year is fully adequate to address the full challenges of poverty. The second, uh, we also know from the research that we need alignment across the age span. Uh, and we, so uh, here we're referencing, it's really important that each year builds on the learning and care of the previous year, and prepares children for the learning and care of the next year. And we need coordination across education, health, and uh, social services at each stage of development. However, as you know from all of your work, uh, we in most communities across the United States were, were, are characterized by what we call fragmentation. We have fragmented mixed delivery systems. We have gaps between zero to five and K-12, between education, health, and social services, and between public programs like schools and Head Start uh, programs and private community-based programs. And so as a result, children experience inconsistent quality, gaps across the age span, and a lack of coordination in each stage of development. And so I'd love to pause here and just ask, in your experience, either in your current community or in your in a former community, could you share with us um, an example in your experience where you've bumped into this fragmentation, where you've thought, my goodness, if only uh, early childhood and K-12 were more aligned, if we were more coordinated, if we were working together, we could do better by children and families. Or if education, if schools were better connected to health programs or social service programs, we could do better by children and families. Any of you have an example that you could share? I think one of the big ones for us is the um, difference in services for in special ed, like OT, PT, speech, for kids mm -hmm. under five and then school age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great, that's a, it's a really good example. Uh, uh, Jill, when we worked in Maine before, several of our communities tried to really tackle that uh, head on. And that I remember very distinctly um, those concerns being raised, uh, being raised then as well. So those are, that's a, a, an important um, a challenge to tackle. Uh, other suggestions? I think the wraparound supports that come or Mm -hmm. that come with that early childhood so like family engagement mm -hmm. and education and you mm -hmm. know the whole team coming together to talk about a, a kiddo when not when they come to uh kindergarten or you know elementary school that kind of stops and then the school mm -hmm. is it, the school is their team instead of the school and all those community providers right um, so they essentially lose that really um important care and uh structure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that uh, that is a, a common concern, and um, you're going to see that your colleagues at the at the state agencies have begun to, uh, or, or, or have the same intention. That is to say, really want to help address that same problem. So, so I, I think you'll find that this initiative has your name on it, Jessica. Um, the uh, others, uh, any other examples of fragmentation? Okay, those are those are great ones. Uh, I'm sure you've all uh, 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 bumped into this in your experience. And so let's let's move on. Um, so as I said, in you know, as a result, children experience inconsistent quality, gaps across the age span, and a lack of coordination at each stage of development. So there are really two movements nationally that are 
uh, working to address these this fragmentation and, and bridge these gaps. The first sometimes, as Leanne mentioned, sometimes goes by the name of P3, prenatal through third grade or birth through third grade. And the idea here is to uh, work on improving quality at each stage of development and alignment across the years, and, and particularly across this gap between early childhood and K-12. So this transition to kindergarten moment is a great opportunity to really begin knitting the two systems together. And the second movement goes by the name of community schools in K-12 education, sometimes integrated student supports. We call it comprehensive services in early childhood. Head Start has done this since its founding. And the idea here is to use schools and preschools as hubs to connect children to services. And so uh, uh, we at EDC have been supporting these two movements for many years. I've been deeply involved with these two movements, uh, both from a research perspective, uh, doing applied research and sharing it with other communities and supporting states and uh, communities. And so back in 2017, I received a uh, grant from the Heising Simons Foundation to do a study looking at communities that were implementing both of these movements. And uh, the I talked to national leaders, I interviewed 18 communities, and I ended up focusing on these and did extensive site visits at most of them. And uh, in 2019, I published a report called All Children Learn and Thrive, Building First 10 Schools and Communities. And this is where I first proposed the First 10 model. And I'll share that uh, brief version of that with you in just a moment. Um, and this study is available at first 10, first one zero dot org. Your fingers are going to run a right T-E-N, but uh, uh, that, won't, that won't get you there. It's uh, first one zero uh, dot org. And so uh, I'll share the model with you in just a moment. I'll quickly say First 10 has been growing since then. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we've implemented in 15 communities, all clustered in South Central uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and that includes rural communities as well as urban communities and suburban communities for that matter. In Rhode Island, we've worked with 12 um, uh, mostly urban communities, first on the transition to kindergarten and now graduating to First 10. In Alabama, we started with one rural community and one urban community um, and are expanding to um, uh, an additional 19 communities this fall. In Michigan, um, we are uh, have been working with six communities, several of which are rural um, across the state and are adding an additional six communities uh, in a month or two. We've been working with two communities in Massachusetts, and we're very excited to be uh, us, uh, with the about the opportunity to support six new communities in Maine. And um, I will say that our previous work in Maine of the 13 communities we worked with, 12 were rural. Um, and so uh, I also want to mention that we we have been awarded a grant from the Kellogg Foundation that allows us to bring our communities together. And this is also something we're excited about. Um, it's, it's this way our communities get to collaborate directly with each other across state lines. So we do some collaborative work within states and we share lots of learning from community to community, but it's really critical, I think, to have that uh, community to community learning and exchange. And we do that with a, a monthly webinar and uh, Leanne and her colleagues in, in, at the state have been uh, uh, very actively involved in that learning network. And um, that is an opportunity for all six communities uh, who participate in this initiative, uh, not only to receive support from us um, and, and some funding to do this work, but also to participate in the First 10 Network. So here's the model in a nutshell. We begin with a commitment to educational and racial equity and the whole child. We summarize that in the expression, all children learn and thrive. By all children, we aim to eliminate disparities by income, by race, by other cultural factors. And by learn and thrive, we have uh, health and mental health outcomes, social emotional learning outcomes, and academic and cognitive outcomes in mind. We then form a partnership that includes schools, community organizations, uh, um, Head Start programs, and families. 
And really with the idea here that we're all, on to, all we are all interdependent and through our collaboration, we get better at what we do. And then we implement three broad strategies. And what I'll say to all of you is that the, these strategies will be familiar to you. What I think is distinctive about FIRST 10 is that we implement these strategies across the early childhood uh, elementary school continuum. So really with a partnership of elementary schools and school districts working with early childhood programs, we implement them as part of a coherent plan and drawing on the evidence-based practices pioneered by FIRST 10 communities, pioneered and implemented and developed by FIRST 10 communities. And so the first strategy is to collaborate to improve teaching and learning. And a good example of our work here is a comprehensive transition to kindergarten plan. So all of our communities implement a, a, a comprehensive transition to kindergarten plan that includes activities for to support families and children throughout the transition. Lots of good creative ideas. Our last network meeting, all of our communities we're sharing spring uh, activities around how to support families. So great stuff happening there, some great connections with libraries, uh, but also um, a lot of substantive joint professional learning across community-based preschool teachers, Head Start teachers, district pre-K, and district kindergarten teachers. And so that's really become a signature piece of First 10 is that joint professional learning in small communities and larger communities. And really what I uh, always uh, hear is that a little bit of magic happens when we do that. That is to say, those kindergarten teachers are just can't believe they haven't been collaborating with pre-K teachers and pre-K teachers can't believe they haven't been collaborating with kindergarten teachers, sometimes even within the same school and certainly you know, across programs. So that's a, an important piece of the work. Just quickly, since I know some of you uh, represent districts and may wanna share this with some of your district colleagues, uh, the research on the transition to kindergarten is really positive. This is a big, nice study, 250 schools, 1,000 children. Uh, rigorous methodology showed that the more preschool to K transition practices that our pre-K preschools do and our preschool uh, pre-K educators do, uh, really a lot of uh, really important benefits at the beginning of kindergarten. And um, what, what folks will tell you is that, um, there we go, I had a little had a little tech problem there. Uh, what folks will tell you is that, um, you know, obviously our kindergarten teachers care very much about frustration tolerance, social skills, conduct problems, learning positive, positive approaches to learning. So this is a gift at the beginning of kindergarten. Likewise, a second study, this uh, uh, also rigorous study, almost a thousand schools, 17,000 children, show that the more transition to K practices we do at the beginning of the kindergarten uh, year, the, the higher our academic skills at the end of, uh, of the kindergarten year. So this is obviously a gift to first grade teachers, but more importantly, to the children and their rest of their education careers. So there's a little bit of research for you on the importance of the transition to kindergarten. The second broad strategy is to coordinate comprehensive services. And here, this is about improving referral system systems, deepening partnerships with health and social service agencies. And we have had um, a lot of luck in our communities getting started as kind of an initial strategy with what we call school connected play and learn. So this is taking off the tried and true play and learn group model. Many of you have probably participated in these. We bring together caregivers and their children. We sing, we dance, we read stories interactively. We do crafts and art and maybe some cooking. We build trusting relationships um, between our facilitators and the uh, caregivers. We always integrate some caregiver learning. I'll talk more about that. We implement these as a series rather than a drop-in and we really emphasize connections among peers, health and social service agencies and schools. So around the health and social service agencies, that's why this is part of uh, uh, one way that we um, coordinate uh, comprehensive services. And this is also an opportunity to begin developing good relationships with school staff. So uh, when we can, we do these at schools. And regardless, we'll have kindergarten teachers or elementary school principals visit our Play and Learn series, provide a warm welcome. We're so looking forward to seeing you in a few years. Uh, read a story, and by the way, um, re kindergarten registration starts in March. Uh, so um, we have found these to be a great starter activity.
There is an example of a virtual play and learn. We're now back to doing these in person. And the third broad strategy is to deepen partnerships with families in culturally responsive ways. This is about uh, doing outreach to culturally specific groups, elevating family voice, developing partnership structures. And it's also about um, a good starter activity here is to launch a community-wide parenting campaign. And uh, the department will give you a menu of possibilities or will give uh, a participating communities um, a range of uh, a menu of services that support these kinds of parenting campaigns. We have found these to be very effective in reaching families and in pulling the community together around a common uh, a campaign and building a common language of parenting in the community. Just as one example, one example some many of our communities use is called the basics, it's five parenting principles, maximize love, manage stress, talk, sing, and point, count, group, and compare, explore through movement and play and read and discuss stories. For each, there's videos, a texting service, et cetera. Again, I think regardless of what approach you use, the idea is to get everybody in the community to really promote uh, the principles of your message. And that's what we have found to be so powerful. Uh, so now we have a new partnership in town. We're implementing three broad strategies and those specific practices, many of those specific practices that uh, we that I mentioned as good ways to start things off. And now it's important that we lead strategically and continuously improve. And so here we make effective use of very focused plans. We meet uh, actually every three weeks. We meet as a whole group uh, to look at the work currently underway in each community. What is working? What needs to be expanded? What needs to be tweaked? And where are there gaps? And then we develop a plan drawing on many of the practices that I mentioned. And then we divide into work groups uh, and meet every three weeks uh, in those work groups, typically for an hour. Uh, what I will say is that the asset mapping needs assessment portion is done relatively quickly so that we can begin implementing strategies. Um, and that has worked, um, uh, we have found that has worked very well to strengthen our partnerships and, and um, uh, begin serving children and families uh, in a timely fashion. Every plan includes impl implementation benchmarks uh, to help monitor our progress. And so that's the first 10 framework, that's the model. And uh, I have a few more slides to tell you about um, the specifics of this initiative, but why don't I pause for a moment and um, see if there are any questions. Any questions about the model, any of those practices I mentioned? Any of that? No questions so far? All right. I will circle back and give you more opportunities to ask questions. So here's the initiative that your colleagues in the State Department have uh, uh, created for you. So one key element that we're really excited about in Maine is that each community school, each school that participates in this effort, what we'll call a first 10 community school, is going to have an outreach coordinator. So this is a full-time position to help coordinate this work, do outreach to families, um, help, help convene the group, and help implement the plan, uh, and, and help to build these connections with health and social service agencies. Some of those wraparound services that Jessica mentioned earlier. So there is a full-time position associated with this. The grant will pay for that uh, position and with some and some additional funding to implement some of these practices. So um, to do the play and learns, to pay the stipends for the joint professional learning, to implement your, your parenting campaign as examples. So the, the funding in year one will pay for the coordinator as well as some of those other opportunities. Uh, and, 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 and strategies. And then the funding, as you see, drops in year two and three uh, with the idea that the community picks up the difference as a way to build in that sustainability. So that's a, a key component of this. And I'll let uh, uh, Leanne talk more about that. And the, 
the main uh, DOE is also in another innovation that we're excited about, is gonna have a full-time staff member in the department to help support this work and to build capacity in the department and provide a good connection to state resources. So that's also an exciting development. And let me just see the next slide. Oh, so in terms of the selection criteria, there are two competitive priorities. One is that the uh, uh, communities are rural. Does it mean that other, uh, you know, urban and suburban can't apply, but it is a priority for rural communities and that there's economic need? And then readiness, that communities have a readiness. And the most important element of readiness from our experience is district buy-in. Right. And so that's what we're really looking for. Uh, we also want there to be buy in on the part of Head Start and community based preschools. Our experience is, is that those those programs are typically eager to collaborate. And so if we have district buy in, we're able to make the progress. And then icing on the cake is if there is some history of collaboration. Um, uh, that's that's great, too. Uh, however, if you don't have a history of collaboration and you have a, a district administration that is supportive of this work, uh, uh, we can make uh, really good progress. So I'll back up to this slide. And uh, 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 Leanne, anything you'd like to add? No, David, you did a great job covering it. Um, I would just say that I think, you know, in our first um iteration with first 10 in the 13 communities that we had worked with having a dedicated position was something we heard from many of them was was one of the pieces that just was kind of missing for them um, they had wonderful leadership teams and that will still be a constant in the model moving forward because this is a collaborative approach but People serving on those teams all have full-time jobs and they're doing their best to try to work through that plus contribute in a collaborative way. And so having a position that can take more responsibility for the day-to-day -day outreach and coordination is something that we heard would be really needed. Um, we're also though very cognizant, you know, when, when we have opportunities through grant funding to support projects like this, we want to be able to help the local levels get positions established, but we also want those positions ideally to carry on beyond the life of the grant. So we're sort of stair-stepping down that support over the course of three years so that in the first year, the support's there totally financially for that position. In the next year, we're thinking probably about half of it would come from the grant. And in the third year, probably about a quarter of it. Um, one of the things we'll work on over the three years is helping you to, to look at other resources that might be able to fill that gap. There are, you know, other funding strategies that can be employed and sometimes it can, you know, it will come through something that the school system might have, but sometimes it comes from community providers who have resources. And so maybe it becomes a position that's funded jointly um, within your community. Um, the other piece that we also felt really strongly about that David mentioned is having a dedicated position in our office, someone who can um, reach out, help provide support and technical assistance. Certainly EDC is going to be doing a lot of that, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we want to make sure that um, our pilot sites are feeling supported. We also want to make sure that we're connecting this work with other initiatives that that have similarities across our state. So some of you may be aware of what's called First For Me, which is another um, granting opportunity that's actually coming from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it will fund up to five pilot sites this year. It's focused very much on the birth to school entry span, which makes it a little different from First 10 that, that um, continues for a longer um, period of time. Um, but it's but it has many similarities, and so um, that as that pilot is rolling out, and for the first ten pilot is rolling out, we want the position in our department to be coordinating with the position at the Department of Health and Human Services, and making sure that we are sharing um, resources and combining efforts when it makes sense to do that. We are going to actually be sharing 
the evaluator between these two pilots. So that will be helpful as well because we'll really be able to see and study over the next few years um, how these different pieces are taking shape. And that should feed forward as we make adjustments and, and seek to expand. And then of course, we also have a community schools effort in our state. Um, and I know that we have um, granted in the past um, some small grants to a few schools to get that work off the ground. And so we want to make sure that we are also coordinating there. Um, and so lo lots of really positive efforts, I think, underway. Um, and as David said, you know, there is a competitive priority for rural schools, but it doesn't in any way preclude any school for applying for the opportunity. It, well, that will come down more in the end if we have a, an abundance of applications and um, it will provide a few extra points in um, those applications. But we, we don't wanna discourage anyone who is interested in applying for this. And the other thing I'll say, um, because the, you know, once we get into the, once the application is posted, then I can't really talk to you anymore during that period, which is always a challenge for all of us, trust me, because I wish I could. Um, but the application itself is, it, we're trying to be very deliberate in making it pretty straightforward. So there's really um, uh, five questions, I think, that we're asking folks to answer, um, a short budget to put together and um, starting to think about who's gonna be on your team and some assurances from team members about their participation. So it's, it shouldn't be a really arduous kind of an application to put together. We wanna make it manageable. Maybe the other thing, David, I would well, maybe okay. just contribute is um, thinking ahead. If you do apply and are, are one of the selected um, sites, okay. we're gonna do a um, online kind of kickoff session at the very end of June. And then we'll bring all of the teams together at the end of July for a more like a day long kind of a, a kickoff session. And then the work will kind of get started um, from that point forward. So just to kind of give you the big picture of, of, in terms of direction and the dates for those are embedded in the application. So you'll, you can kind of reserve that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so we can open it up. Uh, what questions do you have? Um, I'll, I can show one more slide just for fun um, in case this helps to give you a an idea of kind of how the how the work would start. The ones in blue uh, are convenings across the six where we get some basic information out there. And then the other meetings would be your individual uh, planning meetings, you know, starting with the, the the asset mapping needs assessment, moving to planning needs, forming work groups and uh, beginning planning uh, some some outreach to the community. So just to kind of sh give you a shape of what those first um, first couple of months might look like. Uh, but yeah, we'd love to answer any questions that you have. Are there, um, sorry, I'm already thinking about it. Are there requirements or did you lay out, I don't know if you can tell me this, for who we hire? Like, do they have to be a social worker? Do they have to be an educator? Like, are there requirements in there? Yeah, so we suggest, Jessica, that someone with, um, a, I mean, ideally, someone who has a social work background is going to be a great fit for this work. Um, but in the application, you will see kind of a job description for that position. And I think from that, that will probably help you to think about who uh, you're looking for and what qualifications you'd like them to have to ideally have. I mean, we want it to fit your context within your communities as well, right? Yeah, we're just, I'm just thinking about job uh, job shortages and and yeah. I don't want to take from a place- Right, from positions support. that, yeah, yeah, that are established that you need to have working with children and families. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. And the only other question is, is there a definition of community? Like, well, I'm on a peninsula, so like, 
pretty small community. Can we reach outside of the community for resources? And, yeah, and I, partnerships. Def, definitely. Um, you know, the the grants will be awarded to the at the SAU level, so the school right. system level. But we want you to be making connections and partnerships with your catchment area, right? Who whoever your families are needing to turn to, right? Okay. To engage in services. So yeah, that's okay. that's a big goal. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. We had a community uh, in the earlier iteration of this up uh, in the northern part of the state, and some of their partners were an hour away in the city, y you know, and those were just those were the those were the partners. So, yeah. Yeah, we're on a, a peninsula and we you, you don't have a choice. You have to go off to get, <laughs> That's right. get what you want. So I just want to make sure we can yeah, merge yeah. with other communities. I mean, we have a strong community feeling, but we certainly have to leave to go get what we want. Yeah. So that's, that's great to know. Yeah. Any other, any other questions about how this uh, would work? Can I just ask a general question? Sorry, I have lots sure. of questions because I'm doing some of this work right now. So when I think about, you know, I get worried, um, about this, you, Leanne, you brought it up, like so when these positions end and budget season is set forth, I mean, guess what my, not because my superintendent isn't lovely, but if they have to look and cut something, it's going to be with that extra. So I'm wondering if this model, I'm really interested in looking at the research and support because it really is pairing with some things I've been looking at. Have you ever looked at it going to a community, fully community driven, but but provided to the school? So that's like like Penquis, if they had Head Start or CBS, if they had a person, they were the boss of the person, but they sent them to the school to work and do this. Like, have you ever looked at ha having it funded by like a community driven concept? So, so from our vantage point, this is actually something we're adding for the first time, Jessica. So yeah, we didn't yeah. have we didn't have the position when we did this um, gotcha. back in I, I 2000. Can't yeah, in 2018. So that's that's one of the reasons that we're adding it this time around. Yeah, good. But I, from my vantage point, I don't see a problem with who the funder is as long as it's really clear what the role is and the expectations in that role um, right. moving forward. David can probably talk more from a, a national perspective on what he's yeah. doing work in communities. Okay. So Jessica, I will just say that uh, we see both models in, the, in what are called the community schools movement. So you're absolutely right that what you're suggesting is very much a viable approach. We see it work both ways. So uh, we work in York, Pennsylvania, and all of the folks in that position are hired by uh, an outside organization. And in Oregon, where I studied some of this model, uh, they're also uh, hired um, by an outside position, but they still work very closely with the principal. They're on the school improvement team or the school leadership team. They're, I mean, the success of this, what anyone in the community schools movement will tell you is that the success is that this position that Maine is creating be very integrated into the school and work closely with the principal. If the yep. principal says, you take care of the after school programs and you know, I'll pass you in the hallways, um, and you know, you connect families to services. If they're not integrated, then it really doesn't become a community school. It's got to be integrated, regardless of who the respective employers are. So but we see both models. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're looking at creating a regionalized community hub here uh, because of the rural, the same issues across districts. So I was curious if that uh, gets established, if that would work. And it sounds like it would. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other? Um, any other questions? Yeah, Tenny. Um, I just had um, <clears throat> wondered if there was in the grant um, and maybe this is you know, would be designed depending on what school um, applies. But I'm just wondering, is there um, professional development for staff within the grant or is there money for that? Because I think that part of, 
for for public education. I think it's it's a shift in thinking mm -hmm. that zero to five isn't you know isn't just oh oh they'll come to us as a five year old, and and we know best. I I think it's it's a real shift in our thinking in in public education that, mm -hmm. that you know about zero to five. Yeah. I think that's that a really important point, Denny. And uh, yes, there is, you know, the, so really the remaining uh, money that um, isn't ne needed for that position to fund that position is available for the other pieces of the work. And that can include professional learning, some of which we'll be working with EDC to provide. So that's part of what, you know, they'll be working to provide. But then if there's additional pieces on top of that, that you feel like, you know, we could really use this. Absolutely. There's opportunity for you to self-design that. Yeah. Absolutely, Tenny. And I'll just say, um, you know, I, I too really appreciate your observation and agree with that observation. And I can tell you part of the way that we uh, tackle that or address that is through some of the joint professional learning that we organize across community-based programs, Head Start programs, and, and uh, district uh, pre-K and K classrooms. And that really leads to a much better common understanding and starts to bridge those gaps. And I can't tell you, I mean, just this, so we often started off by looking at standards and we'll literally line up the pre-K and K standard the, and have, we use a protocol of questions to look at those standards and then um, uh, and, and discuss what's challenging, similarities, differences, teaching approaches. And I mean, just this week, we, we do this frequently. And just this week, I uh, was sitting with a, a, a mixed group of pre-K and K teachers and the K teachers. One of the first thing they said is, you know, we had no idea all of this was happening in pre-K, you know, and that's just that kind of aha really starts to build, you know, and sometimes we'll do cross-site visits, even use the funding to hire, you know, I know subs are hard to find right now, but, you know, when we can, and then, you know, to have those cross-site visits, and that's another way we break that down. So we do a lot of this through kind of action, um, and, um, and but, I, but, you know, your idea of doing PD on, you know, kind of addressing this directly is also a great idea. So, Absolutely. Uh, other, um, anything else? All right, well, I'm happy to, uh, if anybody has individual questions from my side, um, I think you're allowed to ask Leanne questions on her side until- uh, You until can ask that until that out. RFA gets posted. <laughs> yeah. But we'll also make sure that we send um, when when the application gets posted, I'll make sure I send it to everyone who registered for this as well. It will go out in the DOE newsroom um, for sure, because that's where we post RFAs, but then I'll follow up and make sure I've sent it to everyone on who registered for the informational session. And I'll put our website in the chat, just in case um, want any more information. Thank you all so much. Pleasure meeting you. Uh, we encourage you to apply. Hope this is a good fit for your community. Thank you all. Thank you.